thank you for joining me for another Sunday Afternoons with Reverend Lucretia. I'm so glad you're here. And if this is your first time coming to this station, I'm glad you found us, and I hope you find it inspiring and uplifting. If you want to click on the subscribe button, you will be informed every time we come out with new videos. We do come out with new ones every week. So the name of today's talk is Listen to Learn and Learn to Listen. And the song is Getting to Know You from The King and I. If you'd like to listen to the song before you hear the talk, just go ahead and click on the link. It will be down below in the description. So we're going to be talking about the power of listening, the ancient practice for our future, about the fact that listening is radical. We will have scriptural references to listening as well as the metaphysical understanding of what it is. We will be talking about Max Lafser, who is a unity minister for over 50 years and all of the important lessons about his ministry and why listening is so important. We will be talking about the fact that we have not become very good at listening. Over the years, we've seemed to have gotten worse and worse at listening to people whose point of view differs from ours and that we need to be able to do it differently. We need to understand that listening is a skill and we can get better at it if we focus our minds and make a decided approach that we're going to listen with an ear to understanding better than we have been doing. The ability to build and heal relationship is all based on our ability to listen. So let's go ahead and get started to the power of listening, an ancient practice for our future. This was written by Leon Berg. He is the one of the founding members of the Ojai Foundation in California. He also co-founded the Israeli nonprofit Listening Circles, uh, where he worked with Arabs and Jews to come together to be able to build consensus. Um, together with his partner, Glory, he started something called Tools for Togetherness, uh, which is a therapy aimed at giving couples tools that they can use to make their relationship more loving. And so he says that there's a difference between hearing and listening. Hearing is one of the natural senses that we have. Listening requires focus and attention. As we grow up, we develop patterns of communication that are very difficult to change. And we don't often see that there's a problem in our communication styles until we run into conflict all the time and we find ourselves in dysfunctional relationships. So this all started in the 80s when he was a business manager at the Ojai Foundation. He describes himself as being uptight, stressed out, and he had very severe bronchial asthma condition. So every week they sat around in a circle in something that was called a council and they passed an object that is called a talking piece and they would tell personal stories. He thought this was a total waste of time. As a business manager, he thought they should all just be working harder. He didn't see the value of this at all, but he had to do it. It was part of his job. And so he came to understand after doing it for a while that he actually had resistance to this because he had a great deal of shame and grief about his health condition. And he'd been keeping that inside since he was a child. So he started to talk about it and he realized that as he started to talk about it, his lungs actually improved. And he saw that there was a connection between his physical health and his ability to express his feelings. So in the apocryphal gospel of St. Thomas, Jesus says, if you bring forth what is within you, what is within you will save you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, what is within you will destroy you. We all need to talk, uh, have a place to talk about the things that are inside us that need to be healed. We all need to have a place to go. We have words that are inside us that need to be spoken. So counsel is the practice of listening and speaking from the heart. It comes from the ancient tradition of storytelling, uh, where they would talk about the origin of the tribe, about what the places where you could hunt the best word, play about what herbs you could eat and not eat. It was a long-standing tradition all the way back from ancient times. Research shows that our brains actually are wired for telling stories. It is something that we need to do regularly. They actually suggest that we be doing it one time a week and that we think of it as a listening workout. So he said we needed to learn how to move from head thinking to heart thinking. Carl Jung visited the Hopi Indians in Arizona and he was talking with them and the Hopi Indians said, we think that white men are crazy. They think with their heads. And Carl Jung said, well, how do you think? And the Hopi Indian master said, we think from our hearts. Listening has survival value. We are invoking an ancient tradition where we sit in a circle. We are all equal. We are sharing our human experience. There is no hierarchy. In the center is usually a candle. 
that reminds us of the fire that we all used to sit around together in ancient times. And usually there is something from nature in there as well. The talking piece signifies who is the speaker. And it is the job of everybody else to listen attentively, even devoutly. And he talked about the fact that the Quakers have learned to listen, that they sit in silence for long periods of time until they are moved by the voice of God within them to say something, and then they all listen very attentively, that this practice of listening has been around for a very, very long time. So they now have this practice of doing counsel. Again, this talk was written about five years ago of doing counsel in the LA school systems. And at that point, there were 15,000 students in the LA school systems that were participating in this council once a week. They now do the counsel in businesses, in social services, and in prisons. So together um, with Glory, he worked on building a new way of doing relationships. So when he first started the relationship with Glory, he met her at a party and he decided he wanted to do something very different. So he invited her over for dinner and they sat on these cushions on the floor after they ate. There was a candle in the middle and there was a vase full of flowers and there was his favorite talking piece. And he said, they sat for hours and they told each other about ourselves, what they were looking for in a relationship, what was more important to them in their lives. And that brought them together. They knew instantly that they were right for each other. And Glory later goes on to say, what could be more seductive than a man who wants to listen and share his feelings? So their mentors were Jack Zimmerman and Jacqueline McCandless, and they started what is the path of spiritual growth, which is all about relationships and how to heal relationships, taught the people to stay in the fire of conflict instead of stuffing or acting out feelings. You need to stay with your feelings and let them come to the surface and be explored. Ask questions like, why am I feeling this way? Where did I learn this behavior? And it becomes less scary the more that you do it. You need to allow yourself to have vulnerability and it becomes less threatening, the more vulnerable you are, the more you are opening the doorway to developing deeper relationships. So they started together this practice now that was called Council for Couples, which is where they taught couples to improve their communication skills. They had undisturbed time to listen deeply. If a conflict arises, they would explore it and they don't stuff it. And say so they use their, their very favorite quote from Rumi, which is out beyond the ideas of right doing and wrong doing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. They also used this practice of counsel to do peacemaking work, international peacemaking work. They founded the Israeli Arabs and Jew counsel, Jews Council. They asked the people to sit around in the council together in a circle to say their name, to say where they were from, to talk a little bit about their lineage and their ancestors. The Israeli and Arabs, talked, Palestinians talked about the event in 1948 where 700,000 Palestinians became refugees. And then when it became time for the Jewish people to talk, they of course talked about the Holocaust. So here we had grief, immense amounts of grief and loss on both sides. Both people were sitting there right next to each other and it was possible to have heart thinking. They became vulnerable and they be moved beyond what is right and wrong to a place where peace could emerge. They said, imagine a world where listening is highly valued. You take the time to listen to those you care about, your partners, your children, your parents, your friend, and especially our enemies. Allowing ourselves to enter a vulnerable place is the beginning of wisdom, and our future depends on it. So the next talk I want to bring to our minds is this talk called Listening is Radical, and it is by the founder of the A Seat at the Table, which is part of the Treehouse Institute, where people gather together to discuss and learn about equity, inclusion, race, gender, and climate change. The name of the person who started this is Channel Lewis. She's a young African-American woman, I would say, in about her 30s. She also started the Portland Global Shapers Hub, again, for young people to sit around and talk to come up with changes that they could make so society could be improved. So she's also an avid photographer and she was wandering around the aisles in Maine uh, and she was at an indoor flea market and she was searching for interesting subjects and objects to capture for that Instagram part of gold. She decided to move through the aisles and as she was moving past one stall she heard a voice cry out saying what are you taking pictures of? And in the, in the stall were these two white men in their 70s that had a very cluttered booth that was filled with fishing equipment and boxes full of papers, and they asked her to come inside and speak with them. 
they talked about Maine and how the traditional industries are changing. And they said, it's the computers. They're taking our jobs. Trump will bring them back. Well, this happened to be very much the opposite point of view that she had, and she started screaming in her head, but she decided to just keep the screaming inside her head and not be out loud about it. And she wanted to correct them, but she had decided over a year ago to engage in this new practice, which is radical listening. This is the practice of intentionally quieting your internal voice and judgments, thereby offering your full mental space to the speaker. It allows you to ask more informed questions, to receive well thought out answers and enable worthwhile conversations. We are terrible, she says, about listening to people we disagree with. It's a defense mechanism that has evolved over millions of years. It is made to protect us when we feel the most vulnerable and at risk of being wrong. She says, I believe listening and understanding are ways in which we affirm each other's existence. When people feel left out, or ignored, we experience doubt and extremism in our societies, our communities, politics, and relationships. We've forgotten that every conversation doesn't have to end with someone joining our side. We don't all need to be on the same team. And even more, we have forgotten how to disagree respectfully. Radical listening is very difficult. It takes constant practice and a reminder to yourself to suspend what you presume to know about the other person and their experience. She said she really struggled in this conversation. They brought up political views that were really totally the opposite of what she believed, but she practiced and reminded herself to listen. She said it was not an easy conversation, but we were there and we were sticking to it. Radical listening is a necessary work that doesn't necessarily get easier. What I know won't always change someone's minds, beliefs, and opinions. If I approach every conversation with an attempt to proselytize, I will burn out. So she said she decided she needed to shift her approach and change her expectations, preserve her energy so that she could engage in conversations that were filled with more empathy, compassion, and understanding. Radical listening is a necessary step to effecting change. In order to change our society, I need to know how someone on the other side thinks. I need to try to understand the men at the flea market and the men at the flea market needed to be able to understand her. She said it has to work both ways. She was just getting ready to leave their booth and one of them called out, America, I know, is a country that is made of laws and those laws extend even to law enforcement that use excessive and deadly force against black people instead of protecting and serving them. She had to take a really big deep breath on that one. It was a moment she said she didn't expect. But here she had the opportunity to listen to and learn from people who were radically different than she was. And in that listening, she begins the practice of radical change. She says, this practice has taught me, and I hope it will teach you how to be more comfortable with being uncomfortable. So let's go ahead and look at scripture. Scripture talks about listening all the time. There are over 412 references to listening in scripture. Proverbs 1, 5, let the wise listen and add to their learning and let the discerning get guidance. 12, 15, the way of fools seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. 19, 20, listen to advice and accept discipline and at the end you will be counted among the wise. Ecclesiastes 7.5, it is better to heed the rebuke of a wise person than to listen to the song of fools. Matthew 10.14, if anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. And he's reminding us we don't have to change anybody's mind. We don't have to get defensive. We can just leave. Ephesians 4.29, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And James 1.19, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. So metaphysically, they talk about hearing as the ability to look deeper than words and catch the inner meaning. He that hath ears, let him hear. That's Matthew 13, 9. The Bible indicates that ear is referred to not as the physical organ, but as the listening mind. 
So I want to talk about Reverend Max Lafser. He was a minister for over 50 years, a unity minister. I listened to over two and a half hours of interviews with him. Um, and I found that he talked about listening an awful lot. He talked about all of the greats in unity. He knew them all personally. He talked about his time in school. He talked about his time at silent unity. It was just it, it, wonderful. I'll leave the links. It was wonderful to listen to all of those conversations. Um, he grew up in unity. So his mother was healed by uh, people in silent unity who came to their home when she was very sick. He was mentored by James Dillett Freeman. I know you all know who that is. So his first ministry was actually here in Mesa, Arizona. Uh, he was part of the starting of the unity in Sedona as well. He believed being real was the most important feature of ministry. He also worked at the Unity Temple on the Plaza. Uh, he did a lot of international work. So he worked in the Soviet Union. I'll be talking about that a little bit later. He worked at the Unity in Walnut Creek uh, who were struggling the tragic loss of their minister, Carol Ruth Knox, who had been killed uh, by a deranged person. Uh, he later spent most of his career working with troubled congregations to get them back uh, in order. He worked with his wife Rama in the um, World Peace Movement to promote world peace in the Center for International Dialogue. So he first encountered Unity when he was 12 years old. He was sent to YOU, Youth of Unity. Uh, and two years after college, he went to work at Silent Unity, and then he decided to go ahead and um, go into ministry and get ordained. So three things he said are most important for him. Sometimes I feel like I'm there wherever I am, but there's always this voice beside me speaking through me. Somebody asked me what I thought I had to offer, and I said, I'm just a lover. I don't know what else to do. I try to hear what you want, what you need, and I let God tell whether that's what to do or not to do. I've just followed it like that, that voice that tells you what to do. What's next? It's about being real, creating a safe space and to be real for others. I've made mistakes, he said, but I listen. Most of the people just need to be heard. They don't need to be herded like sheep. They need to be heard. They need to be heard, yeah. I've found most people come, they want to hear what you have to say, but mostly they want to be heard. They want to be considered and they want to be real. But I can't ask you to be real unless I'm being real. I try to be as real as I know how to be. And that seems very important to me, to have an integrity about myself and to listen to what you need. So he worked in the Center for International Dialogue. He took groups to the Soviet Union and he taught conflict resolution training programs, which he says has everything to do with listening. He took groups of up to 500 people. He had an office in the Soviet Union. He had his own place working on the peace committee. He said it's changed over our times. He worked with Mr. Gorbachev. He said he became a friend of his. We did our work together there for eight or nine years. I had an office in Moscow and another one in Kiev, teaching and listening people to bring them to the table so that they could hear each other, listening to their stories, helping them to hear what the other one was saying. They made commitments together that lasted for over 10 years. Listen, listen, listen to my heart song. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you has become my theme song in my heart. I didn't heal anybody. God did. All we did was create space. Isn't that what most people want? To me, that's ministry. We have all these tables that we sit around. So he's still, even still in all of the churches that he works on, they sit around in the mornings around big tables together. Nobody leads. They take turns leading. Everybody gets a chance to talk and be heard. I want people to go home feeling like they've been heard. That's what ministry is for me. I want people to have the ability to know that they were listened to. We listen. You can tell me your story and we can talk about it. It's safe to do that here. This is a safe room. You can just be real. We weren't taught that as children. It's safe to be real here is the affirmation that I use with everyone. We thought we had to put on some sort of beingness or doing this in order to get through. So he had a slight stroke and then a heart attack. He retired for a little while. When he came back into ministry, he started working in Texas. And then he was called out to some churches that were in trouble. And he spent the latter part of his life working with congregations that had suffered some losses and needed to be put back on their feet again with troubled ministries. He taught lessons on conflict resolution and was able to rebuild the churches and get them back on their feet. So he worked in a total of 28 different ministries. He passed on September 23rd, 2020. So here's what I know. I spent the first half of my life not being heard. 
I had the truth inside me, which I spoke about and which was denied. That caused a rupture which took decades to try to heal. Not being heard and understood causes more damage than can ever be measured. It is denying who we are. I spent decades feeling like I was not safe and I could not trust people. God was my strength and it was just me and God. People were scary. They had the ability to hurt you deeply by not listening and hearing your truth. As time went on, I found people that I could trust and I learned how to be vulnerable and I learned that I could even lean on people. It was still God and me, that was my strength, but I now saw him in human form. My best friend in the world has an unlimited capacity to listen. I can talk on and on and on, and he has never, ever, in all of the years that we've been together, cut me off. He just lets me talk until I'm finished. I've never been listened to like I've been listened to by him. He makes me feel heard. Being listened to has changed me. I know I am not alone. I know I am heard and understood. I know I am loved. I believe that the only way we can make a difference in the world is one person at a time. I agree that we are totally inept at listening respectfully to people that we don't agree with. Personally, I just flipped the switch to off in my head. Somehow I've gotten to the place where I don't care why they have opposing point of views in my head. They are just wrong. It's not that I try to argue or to change their mind. I just shut down and put up a wall between us. After this week and lots of research and lots of praying, I get it. If we don't try to keep an open mind, which means trying to understand another person, we will all keep building walls. I like the thought that it's not our job to win people over to our point of view. Their reality of truth is part of who they are. If we want to get closer to people, we have to allow them to be themselves. People need to feel safe expressing their truth. As Michael Jaskin says, I'm starting with the man in the mirror. And if I don't change me and my ability to listen to learn where someone else is coming from, I will never stop building emotional walls. It's up to us to start making a difference, to try to get to know each other better, to try to understand each other, to try to learn who you really are. This will only happen if we listen to learn and learn to listen. And so it is. Remember at all times the power is in you. It always has been and it always will be. I'd love to hear your thoughts on listening and our ability to open our minds and our hearts to each other more fully than we ever had before by not judging and criticizing and allowing people to have their own points of view. I thank you so much. I send you on your way with many blessings.